Well, hello everyone. Philip Shields here. And hello to all my brothers and sisters all around the world. If all you had in your hand were the Old Testament scriptures, what the Jews call the Tanakh, which we call the Old Testament, would you be able to explain the gospel, the good news of God, using just the Old Testament? You have no New Testament available. The early apostles had no New Testament. Uh, Jesus, after his resurrection, had no New Testament. And yet they preached the gospel. I'm wondering if we could do it. So we'll try to do that a lot today. I'll give some preliminary verses first. I do have to refer to the New Testament a couple times in the beginning. But mostly I want to talk about the gospel from the Old Testament. Please study my part one sermon on the true complete gospel because in there, I show you very clearly, yeah, they were told to preach the gospel and they did go about preaching and you'll see what they preached. I put down a lot of verses and they preached the kingdom, they preached Christ, they preached the gospel of peace and so many other things that you'll see in that first one because I try to give you a complete whole counsel of God approach. I'm seeing from time to time though that people will print or put out a booklet the gospel of the kingdom of God, and then the only scriptures they use in that whole booklet are the ones that say they preach the kingdom of God. They don't use any about preaching Christ and uh, preaching the gospel of the, of the grace of God. For example, they use the verse in Acts 20 verse 25 that they went preaching the kingdom of God, but they skip verse 24, the verse just before it, where it says very clearly that they were commissioned by God himself to preach the good news, the gospel, of the grace of God. And that was somehow, let's just ignore that one. I didn't do that. I put all these verses together so you can see what a complete gospel is. Uh, a lot of our Protestant friends, um, a lot of the Protestant friends that we have will preach Christ and that's all they preach, but they don't talk about the kingdom of God much. Uh, we talk about the kingdom of God, especially during the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the other hand, the Sabbath keeping conservative groups that I know uh, like to speak about the kingdom of God, maybe not as much as they should. And very, very little is said about the person, the person of Jesus or even his name, Jesus. I'll say Yeshua a lot in here because that's in the Old Testament. And that's his, uh, that's his, I mean, that's his uh, Hebrew name is what I'm trying to say. The core of the gospel. Surely, in my opinion, surely the core of it has to be Jesus Christ. Has to be, as you'll see, especially if you hear part one. The Apostle Paul said all he really cared to talk about was Jesus Christ and him crucified. Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. And today I want to show you that. 1 Corinthians 1.23 talks about Christ and him crucified also. Today I want to show about the complete gospel, the good news, uh, this time mostly from the Old Testament, and this time including all the promise, uh, the Messiah, the, the, the things that pointed to the Messiah. Uh, it wasn't quite as clear-cut, clear in the Old Testament as it was in the New, where they just came out and said, this is Jesus, and so on. <clears throat> but you'll see what I mean as we go through it. It will talk about the favor, the grace of God to cleanse us from all of our sin. That's in the Old Covenant, the Tanakh. Uh, God's righteousness imputed to us by faith. That's there. God's kingdom, which exists now in heaven and is coming to the earth and uh, will be ruled by Jesus Christ and his saints. And what happens when we die? All of that's in the Tanakh and the resurrections and so on. It's all there. And if the Old Testament is all you had, would you be able to preach just fine without having any New Testament scriptures to use? There's so many scriptures about the kingdom of God. Isaiah 2, Micah 4, Isaiah has a lot of them. Isaiah 2 and 7, 11, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 31, Isaiah 35, so many. And so, we won't have time to go through a lot of those, but just know that there's a lot about the kingdom there. What's interesting to me is that you don't have a single verse in the New Testament, though, where the apostles preached the lion and the lamb. 
They talk about the kingdom of God, but they don't talk about the deserts blooming like a rose. They just don't. And so it makes me wonder sometimes about the emphasis and the focus. They did talk a lot about the kingdom of God ruled by Jesus Christ. Now, because God's good news is gospel centers on the one who is the way and the truth and the life, there's only one way into that kingdom. Uh, if you don't preach Christ a lot, the way into the kingdom is barred. It's locked. It's not there. So we have to preach Christ. Look how Paul begins the book of Romans. Uh, we'll look at it now as I, you start reading it there. Romans 1, verses 1 to 4. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, one sent, separated to the gospel of God. Okay, here's another def uh, or description of gospel. Gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets. He promised through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning the kingdom of... No, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and so on, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now hear my part one, please hear my part one before doing this one. The total good news must, definitely must, include the kingdom of God. Definitely must. Uh, this gospel must be preached and all the world is a witness to all nations and then the end will come, Matthew 24, 14. So, I mean, absolutely, we must include that. But no Jesus, there's no grace for the, to be forgiven of our sins. No Jesus, there's no eternal life that we can come into. No Jesus, it's only given to those who believe in him. <clears throat> no Jesus, there's no kingdom that will be coming to the earth. Yes, I want to talk about the God's kingdom. I want to, but first we have to talk about the way into the kingdom. There's only one way, one door, one name, one person, one being that makes it all possible. And that being is the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Jesus the Messiah. Ha means the Messiah, Messiah. The only name by which we can be saved. Acts 4 verse 12. And then after, after all, we're not saved by our own works. We're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Of course, our works, not by works, lest man should boast, but verse 10, which is rarely read by Protestants, verse 10 says, but you've been created for good works. All right, so we do good works, but those good works do not save us. What saves us is God's favor, God's grace, by faith in Jesus. So I'm very excited about this message, about the good news the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the grace of God, which we will also, that's Acts 20, 24 if you need it, the gospel of the grace of God, which can be a part of the gospel of the kingdom of God. The gospel is all that and more. And I'll be using the Hebrew name for Jesus, which is Yeshua, more than usual because I'm focusing on the good news spoken of in the Bible that he brings using the Old Testament, the Tanakh. The Tanakh is what the Hebrews, the Jews called the, what we call the Old Testament. Now we know the apostles went everywhere preaching the Christ, and they also preached the kingdom of God. They're commanded to preach the gospel, and if you listen to part one, uh, the last third of my sermon, part one, I'll show you that they mostly preached the Christ, because he's the way into that kingdom. But he also brings us the grace and the truth. John 1, 17, the law came through Moses. Grace and through, truth through Jesus Christ. Grace is divine favor. God's grace and truth came through Jesus. We must preach the whole counsel of God. Use all the verses on it. So, Acts 20, 24, I'll, I'll, post, I'll post it right now as we're talking. The gospel of the grace of God. Uh, the good news is the fact that no matter how bad we've been, there's enough grace from God to cover and forgive us, no matter how bad we've been, no matter how bad anyone's been. If that person repents and comes to God and answers the call to be called, they will be forgiven. There is grace for everybody. The more sin there is, the more grace there is, Paul said it also. So you're going to come to know our Savior a lot better in this sermon. That's what Paul said he wanted the most. 
He said in Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9, he said, I, I want to just trash everything else that I, that I have gained, all the trophies in my office, all the plaques on my wall. That's all garbage to me right now. All I want is that I may know him. Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9. So I'm very excited. God wants us to get to know him and his son very, very deeply because it's at the core. He's at the core and the center of what the good news is all about. So we're going to see how the good news is preached from the days of Adam and Eve and Noah. Remember on the road to Emmaus, Yeshua finds these two men really down in the dumps. Their leader, their hero, Jesus, had just been killed. He was supposed to be the Messiah setting up the kingdom, they thought. But no, he was dead. And they had heard some news that someone had seen him alive, but they didn't quite believe that, obviously. Let's pick up the story in Luke 24, verse 25 and 27. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets, all that the prophets have spoken. The Old Testament. Ought not the Messiah, the Christ, same meaning, the anointed one to have suffered. By the way, I do have a blog, a brand new one about Messiahs. Who is the Messiah, the Messiahs? I think you'll be surprised by some things in there. So take a look at it. Ought not the Messiah, the Christ, to have suffered all these things and enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded, to, now beginning at Moses means Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, right? Numbers, Deuteronomy. He expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. There are people who like to say that all Jesus ever talked about was the kingdom of God. Here's a verse that his whole discussion was, didn't you guys see me in the scriptures? Didn't you see me in the scriptures? And then he pointed all that out. And then when they broke bread together with him, and he's holding the bread in his hand, and right here, as he put his hand up there to break the bread, they suddenly saw the nail prints in his wrist. That's what they meant by hand. The hand would go all the way up to about here uh, back then. And you could not support a body by putting a nail in a palm. It would have to be in the wrist. And that's what, it, what happened. And when they saw those nail prints, their eyes were open and he disappeared. So Yeshua certainly taught about himself, the gospel of the good news about Christ, just like the gospel of the kingdom is the good news about the kingdom. Yes, we talk about Jesus. We use his name. We love his name. We worship his name. The Jews wanted to understand life. So that's when the Nicodemus came at night, kind of a, at nighttime so he wouldn't be seen. And he wanted to know about life. You can't be born again unless you're born with spirit and water. And all. Jesus explained all that. In John 3, remember the rich young ruler. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Good teacher, he said. And they studied the Hebrew scriptures, but they didn't recognize their Messiah who was standing right there in front of them. And they missed the way into eternal life. The way through him. So in John 5, verses 37 to 40, I'm going to focus on 39 and 40. The Father himself, John 5, 37, The Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. No one's seen God the Father. But you do not have, uh, you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing, if you want eternal life, you're not willing to come to the source. You're not willing to come to me that you may have life. So that's what we're doing here. And then verses 45 to 47, he talks about if you believe Moses, Moses wrote about me. And then in Luke 24, verses 44 to 49, uh, this is after his resurrection, I believe. And then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. If you guys really understood the Bible, you would understand all those verses about me. 
So I'm praying in Jesus' name that God will open our understanding, like it says in verse 45, especially to my Jewish friends. I have several Jewish friends, and they don't see this, and I'm praying God will open their eyes, take away the veil that hide, that's hiding them from the truth, and he opened their understanding and they, that they might comprehend the scriptures. He opened. God opens our mind. So the true gospel can really be summarized by Jesus Christ crucified for us and raised again, resurrected to be our new creation, eternal life in him. Okay, the good news is Christ crucified and resurrected to be my life so that we can inherit and be part of the kingdom of God. God's wonderful kingdom is all possible because of Jesus, who he is, what he's done. So as I showed in part one, the apostles who were sent to preach the gospel did in fact focus their preaching on Christ crucified and resurrected. Philip's whole sermon, I mean, Philip's whole explanation to, uh, in, in Samaria, I mean, was, was he went to preach Christ, Acts 8, 5, later including the kingdom. Verse 12, Acts 8, 5 and 12. Peter's whole Pentecost sermon was about Jesus. Uh, the first sermon that Paul preached after he was converted in Acts 9, Acts 9, verse 20, the first sermon he gave was proving Jesus was the Son of God and the promised Messiah. And that remained his focus the rest of his life. I, I want to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And later on, he said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 8, he, he says, let me tell you, the, let me remind you of the gospel that I preached. This is it. And he goes on, if you go back and read that, I covered all that in part one. He says, I preached to you that Jesus came and lived a life of perfection and then he died for us and on the third day he was resurrected seen by 500 and so on he says that's my gospel go back and read first corinthians 15 1 and so forth beyond that so thus because of jesus i'm confident that i will be in the kingdom of god and helping set it up around the world because it's not my righteousness that will get me there but the righteousness of jesus christ imputed to me by faith, just like it was to Abraham. Read the last seven or eight verses of Romans 4 and you'll get what I mean. It's all there. So Hebrews 4 says the gospel was preached to Israel. Galatians 3 verses 7 to 9 says the gospel was preached to Abraham. And even Jesus himself said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Now let's go back then to the Old Testament. To the Tanakh, to the book of Moses, Genesis to begin with. Genesis 2, we have the creation of Adam. Adam was a type of Jesus, of Yeshua. Scripture in the New Testament calls him the first Adam. Christ was the second Adam. Romans 5, 14 says Adam was a type of him who was to come. Now, I know if you don't have the Old Testament, you don't have Romans 5, 14. But just understand, Adam, the very first man created, pictured Yeshua. So even in Adam... Adam uh, was the first one created by flesh. Yeshua was the first one created to be part of the kingdom of God and uh, resurrected, I mean, to be in the kingdom of God. Romans 1.4 says that, that by the resurrection, he was declared the son of God. And then he's going to have many brethren, okay? Uh, Christ is. Adam, um, okay, many brethren is found in Romans 8.29. He's the firstborn among many Brethren, I hope I'm one of them and hope you're one of them. So Adam was a type of Christ who is to come. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says Adam, I mean, calls Yeshua the last Adam. So there's a first Adam and the last Adam. Now let's go, what else happened? We come to the tree of life. How many of you have ever thought, as I believe we should, that the tree of life was Yeshua. It pictured the Son of God. And isn't it something they had never taken, they never availed themselves of it. Just like Yeshua said to the Jews, all the scriptures are there full of things about me, but you won't come to me that you might have life. A tree of life pointed to Yeshua. Did you know that? 
How can I say that? Well, because he is our life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So many verses say that when we believe in him, look to him, trust in him, that we have eternal life in him. And I'll put some in my notes. John 6, 33, John 6, 51, 57, John 1, verse 4. So many, many verses. That's just the beginning of all of them. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, we now have a prophecy, a promise of God, the good news of God, that though they earned the death penalty by that sin, that's not the end of it. There's a God of hope. It's a God of glory, God of mercy. And so right here, God speaks to the serpent directly. The very first time the gospel is declared very, very clearly. John 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring. This is NIV, your seed, her offspring. Between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. I know King James says bruise or something, but NIV and others say crush. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel, pointing to the crucifixion 4,000 years before it happened. It's the first mention of the gospel of Christ. 4,000 years later, four human days, a day for a 1,000 years, God's promise happened as Yeshua died for us on Golgotha. Remember what it says here, he will crush your head. What does Golgotha stand for? What does it mean? It means the place of the skull, the head. And it was there on Golgotha when all of Satan's hopes and plans and dreams were crushed. Isn't that amazing? Crucifixion crushed Satan's plans at the place of the head, the skull, Golgotha. It took a while, but God is not bound by our clock and calendar, but that promise happened. 4,000 years later, when he gives a promise, it's a sure thing. But even then, God gave them hope and good news. Before expelling them, they're still in the Garden of Eden. We're about to read. Turn to Genesis 3.22. Let's go ahead and post it. In the Garden of Eden, he sacrificed an animal, probably sheep, perhaps. And so they saw innocent blood spilled. I'm sure, Yeshua, I'm sure God explain to Adam and Eve at this point. I ha we have to take an innocent per person or being in this case who did nothing wrong. I want you to understand that there will be blood in the future that will cover your sins when you repent. And they saw innocent blood spilled probably for the first time. And then he took the skins of those animals and covered them with those animal skins instead of the fig leaves that they had. Pointing to the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. That was all pictured by that. Genesis 3, 22, then Yahweh God, this is out of the Legacy Bible. Yahweh God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and he clothed them. He clothed them. He clothed me. He clothed you as well in the skin, in the body, in the life of his son who died for us as the Lamb of God. I have no doubt this is a verse Yeshua used to explain his calling, the, 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 the curse to the serpent, crush your head that we just read, and this one here we just read. He covered them with skin. I'm sure Yeshua explained that to the two men going to Emmaus. Noah's Ark was a type of Jesus Christ. You could only survive, you could only live if you came into the ark. There's only one door, one door, Jesus, right? The massive ship, you had to be inside or you were going to die. From the worldwide flood. Who is that door? Jesus said, I am the door, John 10, 9. I am the door. There's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved, Acts 4, 12. Nobody else, no other way. That whole ark pictured Christ. 
When we come to Abram, now see, that's not as clear, doesn't it? We don't have a verse saying this pictures the Messiah to come, who's going to be our Savior. In fact, the idea of a Messiah being a Savior slowly develops in the Tanakh. It's not really clear in the very beginning. It's pretty clear to me in Genesis 3.15. He shall crush your head. But that's looking back with all the information we have now. Now, when we come to Abram, later Abraham, Jesus said this about him. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. John 8, 56. John 8, 56. He rejoiced to see my day. That sounds to me like Yeshua explained to him his future mission. He explained it to Abraham. God appeared to Abram, or later Abraham, his name changed, uh, several times. Genesis 12, 7, God appeared to him. Genesis 17, 1, when he was 99, God appeared to him again. Genesis 18, 1, God appeared to him with two angels this time. And it clearly says there that when Abraham looked up and saw them, saw him, and yet we know that the Bible says in three or four places, nobody has ever seen God the Father. Nobody. And yet Abraham saw him at least three or four times. And many others did at different times some other times. And, and so that could not have been God the Father. Could not have been God the Father. Or else scripture is not true. And there are several times when Jesus appeared in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, in, in what we call theophanies, a revealing, a, meaning a visible manifestation of God. A theophany. Genesis 14 is one such place. Melchizedek appears. Well, go ahead and post this as you start reading as I talk about it. Uh, he was the high priest of God Most High. This was Jesus the Christ coming to welcome Abraham, Abraham with symbols, again, of his mission. What were the symbols that Melchizedek presented to Abraham? Bread and wine. Does that remind you of anything? The Passover, right? Jesus said, I'm the bread from heaven. And at Passover, he reminded them, he said, this bread is my body given for you. Eat of it. Luke 22, verse 19. And then this, uh, the cup, the wine, is the new covenant in my blood. So let's read it in Genesis 14, 18 to 19. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. He blessed him, blessed Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And so right after Jehovah, now this was right after the, the battle against the, uh, the five kings, I think it was, and uh, Abraham and his men just wiped them out with God's blessing, God doing it. Right after that, Jehovah appeared to Abraham again in a vision this time in Genesis 15. says, don't be afraid. And he says, but, but you can't accept Ishmael as your promised son. I'm going to give you a son that hasn't even been born yet. I'm going to give you a son. I want you to have him. And it says in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed in Jehovah, believed in the Lord. And so it was accounted to him for righteousness. This was before he was circumcised in Genesis, I think, 17. This is Genesis 15. He's not even circumcised yet. And it was, he's already counted as being righteous because he believed. Because he believed. Now, if you go back and read Romans 4, verses 18 to 25 on your own, please write that down and please read it. Paul brings this whole story of Abraham and says, hey, it wasn't just about Abraham. That story is to teach us that if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we believe in the one sent by God, that we also will have his righteousness, God's righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, imputed, credited to us by faith. Because we believe by faith. Jesus is our righteousness. Romans 4, especially verses 22 to 25.
That's what allows us confidence to stand before him even when we have sinned and we feel so awful. And we feel, how could I, a child of God, have done that, thought that, whatever. Paul said he did all those things which I hate, Romans 7. Romans 8, verse 1, now there's no condemnation though. I'm not standing here in condemnation. I'm not condemned. I've been redeemed by the Son of God who fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law, Romans 8, verse 3 and 4, which some groups don't teach or read very much. Go back and read it. Romans 8, 1, we love. We don't, we're not condemned. Why are we not contempt, condemned? Because Jesus' righteousness has been bequeathed, given, credited, imputed to me and to you by faith. By faith that he, verse 4, fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. So that's why we're not condemned. Because how do you condemn Jesus? You don't. You can't condemn him. He's now in my life. Colossians 3, 3 and 4, I use that verse so often. He's now in my life. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper. Jeremiah 23, verse 5, the end of it, and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. This is the gospel of the kingdom right here. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6. So this same Savior, this same God, Son of God, who's appearing to Abraham, is also going to appear again and rule the earth with righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. In his days Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell safely. And this is his name by which he must be called. He will be called the Lord our righteousness. Do you see that? The Lord our righteousness. Just like it says, righteousness was imputed to Abraham, and now we also can have the righteousness of God. Write down in your own notes. I won't take the time to read it. I've read it many, many times. Philippians 3, verse 9, 10, 11, there where Paul says, I don't want my own righteousness from the Torah. I don't want that. I want the righteousness of God, of his perfect perfection. I want the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ, given me. Philippians 3, verse 9. Please go read it. And 10. That's the righteousness I now have and you have. Yes, even when we sin. As we repent, we're still in the body and life of Christ. It's his righteousness that covers us. So many of you just have such a hard time accepting that. So you don't have the joy of salvation. First, sometime go back and read 1 John 4, verse 17. 1 John 4, 17. Just read it. And see what it says. Uh, Christ is... Just read it. Anyway, Genesis 18, verse 1, Legacy Bible. Then Yahweh appeared to him by the lake of Mamre, the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. Now the NASB version of verse 2, And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, when he saw them, he got up and began, he bowed himself down to the earth and worshipped and went and grabbed something to eat, killed a fatted calf or something, and prepared dinner for them. He saw them, talked to them. But remember, we're told at least three or four times, no human has ever seen God the Father. John 1.18, John 6.46, 1 John 4.12. We just read one in John 5. But Abraham saw this, this particular Yehovah, this particular Lord. He saw him. So it couldn't be God the Father. It couldn't be God, for you, our Jewish friends who might be listening, it couldn't be God Most High. Because no one's seen God Most High. Okay? No one has seen God Most High. I'm going to change that in my notes to say Most High instead of the Father here, because just make sure we understand. So this Yehovah whom Abraham saw and had dinner with was the future Jesus, who also is God. 
But God the Father is also Yehovah. The future Jesus was also Yehovah because it says so. It calls him that. But no one's seen God most high, but someone saw this Yehovah. So this had to be Yeshua. There's only one God kind. I'm humankind. I'm a person. There's the angelic kind. There's the human kind. There's the animal kind. There's the plant kingdom. And there's the God kind. There's only one God kind. But right now it's composed of God most high and someone who's not quite as most high. Members of the God kind are not equal. Otherwise, why would you call one most high? The word of God became flesh, John 1, 14, and said, God his Father is greater than he is. Greater. So there's, that's why I, don't, I can't preach the Trinity because they teach it's one being somehow in three persons, but one, and they're all equal. No, they're not. No, they're not. I have to give a whole sermon just on Trinity, although I did give a lot of this in the sermon on the Holy Spirit. And I hope you'll hear that if you haven't. In fact, God Most High is called the God of Jesus. Ephesians 1.3, Ephesians 1.17, John 20.17, where Jesus, upon his resurrection, says to Mary Magdalene, I must go to my Father and your Father, to my God. He's resurrected now. He's calling God... Most High, my God. God the Father. God Most High has no God above him. He is Most High. God the Son of God Most High has a God over him as God the Father. Ephesians 1.3. That's not often preached. I don't hear it much. But it's in the Bible. So Jesus, Having a God totally destroys the Trinitarian concept of three persons and one all equal. Now go to John 8, 56, 58. We'll start posting it, no doubt, in various times. Yehovah appeared to Abram. He must have taught him what his role uh, would be. He says that Abram rejoiced to see my day, John 8, 56. He rejoiced to see my day. Then the Jews said, verse 57, you're not even 50 years old yet. How can you talk about you've seen Abraham or Abraham seen you? And Jesus explained to them, now get this, and they know what he was saying. They knew what he was saying because they started picking up rocks when he said this. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, before he existed, I am, using the same language from Exodus 3, what is your name? And basically, the name that God gave to Moses is I Am. And he's saying it right here. Before Abraham even existed, I was there. I Am. The next verse, verse 59, John 8, 59, shows the Jews of his day understood exactly what he was claiming. That he was claiming to be God, the Son of God, as they began to pick up stones to kill him. All right, so there again. In Isaac also pictured Jesus. The story of the nearly sacrifice of Isaac is in Genesis 22. This clearly is a prophetic picture of the gospel of Christ. Isaac was born when Abraham was 100. So this probably was about 20 or 30 years later. I do not for a second believe that he was an 8-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old, whatever. One reason I don't believe that is that it says that Abraham hewed a lot of wood, and you'd need a lot of wood to burn a, a, a human being. And he gave it to Isaac to carry up the, the hillside, the mountainside. So he was not a little child. Isaac was the only son of Abraham who counted. It's John 3, 16, God gave his one and only son, pictured him. Isaac was not a child anymore but was about 20 to 30 years old, plus or, plus, or, plus or minus. Isaac carried the wood, Genesis 22, verse 6, just as Jesus carried the wood of the cross. Are you getting the connections? The various ones who made commentaries, Adam Clark said he was 33 years old. Um, Josephus said he was 25 years old. Josephus, the Jewish historian. Um, 
Adam Clark said 33. Jameson Fawcett and Brown says over 20 years old. So all of those scholars, all of those scholars did say that over 20. And yet, like Christ, he willingly submitted himself to be crucified. I have a right to lay down this life and no one takes it from me, he says. I think that's in John 10. No one takes it from me. Same way here, once Isaac knew what Abraham was trying to do, Isaac, as a young 20, 25, 30-year-old man, could have easily floored Abraham, his father. Easily. No, he let himself be tied. Let himself be sacrificed. But he was not. But it pictured Jesus Christ. I love what it says in Genesis 22. Verse, verses 5 to 8, and Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we, and we will come back to you, as the New King James has it. This is the first time the word worship is mentioned in all of Scripture. The law of first mentions, as I've mentioned to a couple other sermons, is very significant. I think we have so, might be too strong of a word to say perverted, but we have changed the word worship to suit our likes. We call the worship service when the stage is full of guitars and singers and microphones all kinds of things going on. It becomes a concert almost. The first time worship is mentioned in the Bible is between a man who's about 120 years old or more and his son. Two people. No stage, no microphone, no LED lights, no flashes of light, no smokes, no smokes going off. Nothing. No choirs. When we go to worship before God, the word there means to bow down. Not just literally bow down, but in your whole life, you're bowing down your, what you have to do. Now here, Abraham's going to worship by, I am giving you what you have asked me to give you. What is most dear in my life right now, I'm worshiping you by bowing down and obeying you with this. No choirs. No microphones. I'm really against calling the singing the worship service. It's all right to sing. Lots of verses about singing. It's not the worship service, though. Anyway, this is a prophecy for Messiah, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I'm not against singing. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> I love singing. I love, this. I love the hymns and all that. But that's not the worship service. Now, here, God bailed Abraham out, let him see a ram caught in the in the bushes, in the thorns, just as they put thorns on Jesus' head. And the ram was sacrificed instead. But for Jesus himself, there was no plan B. There was no ram in the bush. They certainly crushed the thorns upon his forehead. And so he condemned the curse about the land will produce thorns. That was part of, it, part of what he condemned by his actions. There's no ram in the bush, just this beloved son, his perfect son, in severe pain on the cross. God the Father, God Almighty, had all the power to stop it, but did not, because of his love for you and for me. Overriding his love for his son, because he knew this was the only way that he could have everyone else forgiven. So he offered his son. The Father gave us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, His only begotten Son, for our redemption, for our forgiveness, for our righteousness, for our new life creation, the new created life. Hallelujah. It's all here. Genesis 22 is the gospel. That's the gospel. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. And praise you, Yeshua, for the amazing love you have for all of us humans. Praise you. Now in verse 6, Genesis 22, verse 6. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. Isaac asked his father about, hey, I see the wood, I see the fire, but where's the lamb? 
And the wording here can actually mean several things, but Abraham says in verse 8, My son, God will provide himself. It says for himself here, but God will provide himself, the lamb, for a burnt offering. So the two of them went on together. And then you know how the angel of the Lord stopped Abraham, since you have not given up your son, your only son. Stop, don't harm him, don't kill him. Genesis 22, verses 11 to uh, 12, and then Genesis 22, verse 18, 17, 18, 16, 17, 18. Angel of the Lord called again. Uh, you have not withheld your son, your only son. End of verse 16. I have it underlined and bolded. In verse 18, because of that, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. So the Apostle Paul explains that the seed pointed to Yeshua, the Savior. Now, let's jump ahead now. There's more we could say in Genesis, but let's move now for time's sake. I'm not going to begin, begin to cover all of it in the Old Covenant. That must have been a long walk to Emmaus, probably five or six miles, maybe more. As we come to the book of Exodus, we find the prophetic Jesus again very clearly shown us in Exodus 12, in the Passover lamb, they could have a lamb of the sheep or a kid of the goats, either one. They were told to find a perfect lamb or kid with no blemish to picture him. And they were to hold it for four days, just like believers had to hold off for 4,000 years from the promise in Genesis 3.15 to the time it actually happened. 4,000 years later, four days, a day for a 1,000 years. Then the lambs were slain. And go ahead and let's post Exodus 12, verses 5 to 11, as I speak here. And the, they were supposed to take the blood from the lambs, from the basin with some hyssop bush, and smear blood on the top, up above the top lintel, on the side post as well, picturing where Yeshua's head would have been and his hands would have been to the side. On the cross, long before crucifixions were ever known. And then that night when the death angel would come, any house that did not have the blood, the people were not under the blood, they died. The, not all the people, but the firstborn animals and children, the firstborn sons, it was sons. Not daughters, or sons only were the ones involved here. Sons and animals. So verse, Exodus 12, verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish. You can take it from the sheep or the goats. Verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th. That's 10 days later. They were to get it on the 10th day. And then kill it between the evenings at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel. And then you shall eat it in haste, verse 11. I have to go through because of time. I'll speed through. And your staff in your hand, sandals on your feet. And you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. It's not our Passover. It's the Lord's Passover. Now continuing in Exodus 12, verse 12 and 13. I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, at midnight he did, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am Jehovah. No one else but me. Who's that? The blood, verse 13, shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I have a whole series of sermons on that title, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where we get the word Passover. I will pass over you. The plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. What a perfect picture this Passover lamb or goat was of the Son of God, who was the Lamb of God. John 1 29, I think verse 32 says it again. John 1 29, 1 Corinthians 5, I think it's verse 7, Christ our Passover. And this was fulfilled perfectly. I, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 7, the verse that Philip explained to the Ethiopian eunuch in, in, in Acts 8, that uh, it'd be like a sheep going to its slaughter. And Isaiah 53, verse 6, 
God laid on him the iniquities of us all. God laid on him, on Christ, on this Passover lamb, the lamb of God. He didn't lay our iniquities on anybody else. Get that. So clear. God laid on Christ the iniquities of us all. There's still some that believe Azazel is Satan. It's wrong. It's just plain wrong. And it says so right here, Isaiah 53, 6. God laid on him the iniquities of us all. Now, okay, so that's that, the Passover lamb and all that pictured Jesus Christ. Now, later Moses prophesied that there'd be a great prophet who'd be coming who was kind of like him, a prophet like me, Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 19. Jesus was that prophesied prophet. If it wasn't Yeshua, I want to ask my Jewish friends, if it wasn't Yeshua, who else could it have been all these years? Who else fulfilled it so perfectly? And the rock that was struck and that gushed out water, that pointed to Yeshua. He was to be struck just once the first time. And then when they struck a rock again, he was not to be struck a second time. Yeshua was not to be crucified a second time. And so Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land because he didn't obey the instructions to speak to the rock the second time. When we don't follow instructions, we cannot be the leader. And so at that point, he was replaced by Yehoshua, the full name of Yeshua. Joshua pictured Christ. His name is Yeshua, shortened form of Yehoshua. And Yah is salvation. Let's continue. I don't have time to elaborate on all of these. You can study them on your own. All the sacrificial animals, the bull, the sheep, the goat, the dove, all of them pictured a different aspect of Jesus Christ. All of them pictured that. There were five sacrifices, the burnt offering, the sin offering, the peace offering, and so on. Five sacrifices also all pictured Christ. The tabernacle itself and everything around it, the numbers of five and grace are all through there. The altar, and you come and you repent. You come through the one door. You repent. You wash up, baptized. Repent and be baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit. Then you go inside, and there's the menorah, the light of God that comes into our life. And then you come, and on the other side was a showbread. He's our life. It feeds us. And then ahead of us was the altar of incense. And then there's a veil there. And when Jesus died, that veil was torn in half. All of that pictured Yeshua. The ark and the mercy seat. Mercy triumphs over just judgment. The Ten Commandments were inside. But over that is the mercy seat. It all pictured God in Jesus Christ. All of it. So all of this, it's the gospel of Christ. That's the predominant part of the gospel. I was raised the predominant part of the gospel is the kingdom of God. No, the predominant part of the gospel is the gospel of Christ, about Christ. Just like the gospel of the kingdom is about the kingdom. The gospel of Christ is also about him. All of the book of John Chapter by chapter by chapter is all about him. John 3, talking to Nicodemus, how you have to be born again, and it was through him. And John 4, he talks to the woman at the well. I think that's John 4. And, and he, he, he declares for the first time to someone as bad as this woman that he is the Messiah, the promised Messiah. And you keep going in John 6, I am the bread of life. And he who eats my, of, of me shall never die. And you keep on going, John 7, come to me, all you who thirst, and I'll give you, you know, waters flowing out of your bellies. And John 8, I'm, I'm doing this from memory, so I, I hope I'm getting this all right. Uh, John 8 was the healing of the, um, no, that was the woman caught in adultery. 
and then later on the, 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 the man who was blind. And John 10, I'm the door, the, light, the sheep, and everything else. I'm the shepherd. I'm the door. My sheep hear my voice. Every single chapter in the book of John, he's talking about himself. Because by the time John wrote it, he began to realize people are not talking about Jesus like we did in the beginning. Anyway, continuing on in Numbers 21. Later on in the wilderness, the Israelites were complaining because again they had ran out of water and they were so tired of this worthless bread. Numbers 21 verse 5. This bread is terrible. So this angered God. We'll post it now in Numbers 21. You can start reading it. Whom Paul said was really Christ, by the way. Did you know that? Then when it says God was upset, Paul said this God who was upset was Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 9. And so God, Christ, sent very poisonous snakes. Could have been the Egyptian cobra. It could have been a number of snakes. As most translations have, the word fiery is very poisonous, venomous. The snake bite apparently was hot and fiery. So look at what happened. So God sent fiery serpents, and they bit the people. Many of the people died. Therefore the people came to Moses, Oh, we're so sorry, we're so sorry. We spoke against you and against God. Please take away the serpents, okay? We pray that Jehovah, the Lord, will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now verse 8, you pray for your enemies. You pray for those who despitefully use you. You, you bless those who are cursing you. And that's what Moses did. Verse 8, then the Lord, Jehovah, said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, so it made one of bronze, and it shall be that everyone who's bitten, when he looks at it, that's all he had to do, just look at it. Didn't have to grovel in the dirt, didn't have to fast for five days or something. No, just look at it and believe. Look at it, that person will live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it out on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. The same way when we look at Christ, gaze upon him, want him, we also will be saved. That's a picture of Jesus Christ, and Jesus said so. As we post John 3, verses 13 to 15, all they had to do to be healed was look, simply look. Saved by grace, not of works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Yeshua became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, pictured by that serpent. He became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. So John 3, 13 and 15, Jesus himself said, no one's ascended to heaven. No one's gone to heaven except I who have come down from heaven. No one's gone to heaven. Please, do you believe Jesus in that? That's what he said. Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Just look and believe. And then comes the very next verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that all who would believe in him, just look, believe, should not perish but have everlasting life. Then the next verse, I believe, says, God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We've got to quit being condemning of the world. I do, you do. Our Father did not send Yeshua to condemn the world. He did not. And yet we're so condemning sometimes in our sermons and condemning the world and people of the world. Father did not send his Son to the world to condemn the world. Let's get it. Anyway, Moses pictured Jesus. 
drawing us out of Egypt. Moses means drawn out. He was drawn out of the Nile. God is drawing us out of Egypt. Joshua certainly pictured Yeshua, which is his namesake. Joshua is the Hebraic sense of the word Yeshua. And he's the one who led them into the promised land. That's who he was. That's who's going to lead us into the promised land. There's the virgin birth. I'm very aware that the word for virgin, I believe it's Alma, or maybe something else. I, I shouldn't say it. I'm not sure. I think it's Alma, though. But uh, the word for virgin can mean an unmarried woman, a young woman, someone who hasn't had babies yet. It doesn't necessarily mean virgin. But the one who wrote in Matthew later on believed, Matthew certainly believed that it, or Luke certainly believed that it referred to virgin. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself, himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called God with us. God with us. God with us. Hear this, people. Hear that. The Jewish Tanakh says, Behold, the young woman is with child. She shall bear a son, and she shall call his name God with us. Emmanuel. Virgin, young woman. It's going to be a sign from God that God is with us in this child. Luke 1, verses 26 to 35, I'll just post it while I'm talking about it, that in the, in the description given by Luke, I said Matthew a while ago, but here Luke, Gabriel, the angel of God, was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, Luke 1, 26, to a virgin, betrothed. Now, and here in the Greek, the word virgin here is virgin. Betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And you can read the story. And then verse 31 in bold. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. I'm sure Gabriel was not speaking English to her. I'm sure he was speaking Aramaic or Hebrew. And he would have said Yeshua. He will be great. And will be called the son of the highest, for the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, this did not happen in his lifetime, so therefore a lot of Jews rejected Jesus. Not realizing that there's a two-part to the story. The first part is he had to come and be the savior. He had to come and die, live and die. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, had to come and die for us as a servant, as a humble servant, coming on a donkey. And then he's going to come back a second time, this time on a white charger, spiritual spirit horse, and rule the earth for, you know, bring the kingdom of God here. And then Mary said to the angel, how can I know this since I've known no man? And he explains in verse 35 that the power of the highest shall come upon you and you shall have the Son of God. So many verses. I just don't have time to go over nearly all of them. He'd be brought out of Egypt. Hosea 11.1. 1. That was fulfilled. I'll put this in the notes. Yeshua's ministry would begin in the despised area of Judea, which was up north. These were the uneducated Gentiles. These were looked down on. This is where the poor people lived. This is where they lived. Matthew 4, verses 12 to 17. It was the backwoods area of Judea prophesied in Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, that he will be coming, that there will be great light in the land of Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness, verse 2 of Isaiah 9, have seen a great light. Scores and scores of prophecies fulfilled by Yeshua. And if Yeshua wasn't the promised Messiah, then who else could it be? Who else could it be? He was born in Bethlehem. He went to Egypt, brought out of Egypt. He, he came, started his ministry in Galilee, as it was said. And all these things here. And anyway, even the name of his betrayer, Judas. Judas is the Greek form of the Hebrew name, Yehuda or Judah. 
Even his betrayer was named after the tribe that Yeshua belonged to. Judah is his Hebrew name, or Yehuda. It just keeps going on and on. The wounds between his arms were given to him when I was wounded in the house of my friends. Zechariah 13, 6. Oh God, we pray that our brothers and sisters who are Jews, please remove the veil, Father. Help them understand and just start praising your, you and start praising your son. Their Messiah has come. He was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew who attended synagogue, who kept the Torah perfectly. He was accused of breaking Sabbath because he did things that the oral law said you shouldn't do. But it was good to heal on the Sabbath. Things like that. He said, I'm not come to destroy anything from the law and the prophets. Please, my Jewish friends, listen carefully to this. And then go back and read the forbidden chapter that's never been read a single time in your synagogue. Isaiah 53. You read it yourself. Who else is that talking about? I gave a sermon on the forbidden chapter. So I don't want to repeat all of that here, but Isaiah 53 was not, if Isaiah 53 wasn't fulfilled by Jesus, who did? Who else could Isaiah 53 be talking about? Rejected by everybody. Condemned, ridiculed, despised, killed, buried with the rich, was killed between robbers. Everything Isaiah 53 says happened. Psalm 22 also describes a crucifixion a thousand years before there was such a thing as a crucifixion. Describes a pierce my hands and my feet. I see all my bones. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22 verse 1. That's never read in the synagogues either. Please, my Jewish friends. Read your Tanakh. Read your Tanakh. I encourage you to read the New Testament as well if you never have. It was written by Jews. All the apostles and early believers were Jews. If Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 aren't talking about Yeshua, who else could it be talking, they be talking about? Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. All of that happened. Psalm 22 says they, they, they'll cast lots for my garments, and they did. They did. But when he died, he was not supposed to stay in the grave. That was prophesied. The gospel of Christ, the gospel of our Savior. Psalm 16, verses 8 to 10. I have set Jehovah always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in the grave. Shill. The Tanakh says the grave. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Corruption began in the fourth day. What's this telling us? Remember how long Lazarus was before Jesus got there? And he stinks now that he was still. It was over three days. I think it was four days. So indeed, Yeshua was resurrected on the third day, at the very end of it. There's so much more about the good news of Yeshua, the Son of God. And again, don't forget, especially in the book of John, chapter after chapter is about him being the bread from heaven, the good shepherd, and uh, the tree of life, and, 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 and the vine. I am the vine, and you are the branches. John 15, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. John 16 and 17, his prayer to his father. And John, I think it's 14 or 16, where he talks about my, my peace I give you. 
not as the world gives. I mean, it's all about him in the book of John. The gospel of Christ. I heard sermons preached where I was told he never preached about himself. I don't believe that. Can't read John. And even the other gospels. So he's going to be the king of kings coming again, this time to set up the kingdom of God on earth to rule from Jerusalem. But it boils down to even the kingdom of God is about rulership, ruling with justice, love and mercy and kindness and fairness. Come, Yeshua, come. Daniel 7, verses 13 to 15. I was watching in the night visions. Daniel 7, verse 13. And behold, one like a man, as the Tanakh puts it, one like a man, or son of man, as my New King James puts it, coming with the clouds of heaven, a man. Jesus was a man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, that's the Father, and they brought him, God Most High, and they brought him near before him, and then to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, languages should serve him and his dominions and everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom has the one which shall not be destroyed. So then all the prophecies of Isaiah 2, how all the nations are going to come and worship in Jerusalem. Come, let's go to the city of, the, of our Lord and let him teach us his ways and they shall no more learn about war. Micah 4, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 35, and the deserts blossoming like a rose, and the gospel of the kingdom of God, and peace and love, truly, finally, here on earth. Zechariah 9, 9, a lot of us like to quote that one because it talks about him riding on a donkey, coming with lowliness, and having salvation, a colt. He's riding lowly on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Keep reading because the next verse is also about Jesus. But the next verse is about what happens in the second coming. And I'll cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem, the bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from east to west, from sea to sea. I mean, that's what happens when you take your glasses off. <laughs> and from the river to the ends of the earth. That's the second coming. Jews never saw the two comings. That's why they missed him. Don't miss your Messiah, my fellow friends in Judah, in Israel. Don't miss your, desire, your, your Messiah. I'll have to end it with that. The gospel of the kingdom of God has to be front and center about the Son of God coming as a man, a son of man to save mankind, to live a perfect life, to die for us all, to be resurrected, to become my righteousness, to become my new life, my new creation life in him, by faith in him. Praise God. Please understand we're receiving the righteousness of God by faith imputed righteousness. His promises truly are good news, and then he'll set up the kingdom that will rule the earth in righteousness and peace at his second coming, which I hope is soon. Not tonight. It's just 2023, the end of it. Probably not for a few more years, but pretty soon. Be ready. Don't get ready. Jesus said, be you therefore ready. Father in heaven, we raise our hands in love and praise and adoration to you. We just love you so much. And Father, we ask that Jesus will be sent soon by you. He can't come unless you send him. Yeshua, the Messiah, send him, Father, send him. Help us be ready in seeking you and putting you first in our lives, changing our lives, being filled with your Holy Spirit, doing your work, getting the, the good news out to as many people as possible. May people understand this message and understand that the core of the gospel is Christ and him crucified and resurrected to become our life. Yeshua, thank you so much for being 
what Isaac pictured being willing to be sacrificed, that you, like a sheep for the slaughter without complaining, praise you, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. And now come and live in us. Pour out your Holy Spirit, your holy anointing Holy Spirit into my life and the lives of those listening. Thank you for everything. Thank you for your blessings. Watch over your people with protection. Let us have faith in you. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.